Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Good Friday evening service. Can I remind you that on Sunday morning, 8 o'clock, at the harbour, there will be the early morning service and also 11 o'clock here in St. Michael's on Easter Sunday morning. We gather in the house of our Lord on a day that is so confusing in many ways, yet so defining in so many others. We gather on this night to remember what our Christ did on our behalf. This is actually our first Good Friday evening service held here in the church since 2018. I didn't realize it until I started preparing the service. 2019, we had our first trial of the joint afternoon service in North Esk. 2020, all churches were closed in about the third or fourth week of Lent. 2021, we held our service was held on Zoom. And then last year, if you remember, we had a joint evening service in the church hall. So we approach this evening, the day we call Good Friday, surely the blackest of days, surely we recall the darkest of moments, a day when the hearts of many were broken, a day when the faith of many was tested to the very limit, a day when human anger surfaced in the most horrible way, a day of pain and of suffering, a day of death. Hell was let loose, and for a split moment, love looked as though it had lost the way. This is the day that we call Good Friday. Let's stand and sing together hymn 392. When I survey the wondrous cross. Can people see that the, the words on the screen? Are they coming up okay? I think that it's better visible in some places. If not, you, if you want to get the hymn book, then please do so. Um, but let's stand and sing together. When I survey the wondrous cross.
Let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Lord, our God, our Savior, who is the Christ, this is the day when you took it all upon your shoulders. This was the night, faced with the false charges of religious leaders and ruling governments, to the Father's call, you remained faithful. Our Lord wounded for us, willingly taking the punishment of the world. In this you have made us whole again. Lord, we can do no other than bow before you with thanksgiving and praise for the pain you bore that we might know life in all its fullness. Betrayed by one who was close to you. Betrayed by that sign of affection. Betrayed by a kiss. The laughing soldiers and the sneering crowd. Many unaware they were mocking their God whilst others knew exactly what their plan was. For the pain you bore, that we might know life in all its fullness. Forgive us, Lord, when we take our turn to be part of the crowd crying out for unfair justice, ignoring the right to a fair trial and the opportunity of giving an account. Forgive us, Father God, when we wash our hands of listening to others for the pain you bore, that we might know life in all its fullness. To you, our God, be all glory, honor, and praise. Amen. The first reading is from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 27, verses 45 to 56. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion, and they that were with him watching Jesus, saw the earthquake, and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which 
was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. Amen. We stand to sing together hymn 383. While Mary was watching, they hung Jesus high. The second reading, again from the Gospel according, according to St. Matthew. When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea, named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulchre. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, 
and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Amen. This afternoon at the service we had in Northeast Church, we marked that moment of the death of Jesus as recorded in John's Gospel. This evening we look at Matthew's account of that moment, but we will move beyond that to the burial and the sealing of the tomb. I want to focus on the wider story. It's filled with so many tensions and so many opposites pulling at each other. It's something that we've been looking at this year as we've been journeying through Matthew's gospel, the way he does this. But before I open all of that up, I want to focus on one central moment. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain, from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. This huge, great, thick curtain hanging in the temple place, sealing off the most holy, the holy of holies. Only the high priest could enter through this curtain into this place. And such was the secrecy. He was only allowed to do that even only once a year. This tearing down of the one thing that prevented the ordinary people from being in the presence of God. This great big thick curtain rent in twain and falls immediately direct access to God is made possible through the death of Jesus Christ. Full atonement has been made for all people. Christ has entered in and gone through the most holy place and is in the presence once more of God himself. Christ is for all people. Christ is the medi mediating high priest of us all. And that rending in twain of the curtain tells me it now makes it unnecessary for any human priesthood to stand between mankind and God. For God is available to us all. All believers have immediate access to God the Father through God the Son. As we have been journeying through this week, we heard earlier of a friend who became a betrayer. We are told how his closest disciple will be reinstated even though he has denied his Lord three times. A whole host 
of tensions and opposites. It was through the manipulation of the Sanhedrin, the power makers and the law keepers, that Jesus even ended up in front of Pilate at all. During the build-up to that moment, we have witnessed this innocent Jesus held captive, brutally tortured, where a guilty man called Barabbas is set free by the mob. We hear on that hill the robbers on either side nailed to a cross. And we're told that they join in with those on the ground, heaping insult after insult upon the only innocent one there. We witness the soldiers in their quest for blood and sport and some fun flogging and beating Jesus, quite literally ripping the flesh from his back. And then the opposite. Well, at the very end of the sorry episode, his colleague positioned at the foot of the cross says to anyone who will listen, truly, this was the Son of God. Here at that cross, we ask the question, where are his followers? There are plenty shouting against. But where are the ones who will shout for him? Described as many women watched from a distance. They were the ones who followed Jesus to care for his needs. And then there's one great tension unfolding. Those who handed him over according to their laws, their people's rules. Even Pilate admits before them, I can't find any evidence to condemn him according to your laws. The great tension comes when they are held to account in those final minutes of Jesus' life. When he had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. Jesus declared that no man could take his life from him. Only he had the power to lay down his life and take it up again. But this action on the cross was an action that he took, choosing to remain faithful to the Father and to the will of the Father. Jesus was living in and through the Spirit. The world was living in and through their own written laws. They sent him to die. Not even according to their laws. And at the very end, Christ dies to the Spirit. Throughout his gospel account, Matthew makes it very clear that Jesus was a king. And isn't that the greatest tension of this whole episode, this whole gospel? Right from the very beginning, the one who was born as a Bethlehem babe causes wise men to cover an entire continent 
as they come to worship the newborn king. This man, Jesus, now nearing his end, is sold like a slave. 30 pieces of silver, that's all he's worth. Not even a good price for a slave. Now this man, Jesus, gets to wear the royal robe. He gets to wear the kingly crown. But the robe and the crown aren't offered with pomp and ceremony. They are offered with cruelty and mockery. There's no joy and merriment. There's no feasting and partying. But there is blood weeping from his wounds, soaking into his robe. There is blood running down the sides of his face because of the crown that he now wears, a crown of thorns. And there's an irony in all of this, because according to his accusers, why they took him to Pilate, you must get rid of him, he's claiming to be a king. And Pilate orders the soldiers to put a place above his head, a notice saying exactly that. They called him the king. They mocked him for being the king. And when accused, Jesus said, you say that I am. The greatest tension of all, the greatest pulling of emotions is smashed to pieces on that cross. And that tension is the way that people treat people and God treats people. When we are the accused, we will go all out. We will put forward our case. Jesus stays silent and allows them to use their words of condemnation. How does the world react to a miscarriage of justice? Sack the legal team. Call for a retrial. We must win the next one at all cost. Jesus reinstates those who have slipped but for a moment. How would we treat someone from within our kin and kindred who turns out to be a traitor. We would condemn them. We would ostracize them. How would we treat a wrongful punishment? We would seek revenge. We would look to strike the blow just as Peter did in the garden with his sword. How does God handle all of that? Jesus says, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. How are we at the foot of the cross treating death? 
Is it the end? Are we confused? Are we lost? Is our head filled with the questions, why? How does God treat death? He offers us life eternal with no more crying, with no more ends, with no more confusion, and with no more questions. Forgiveness and salvation, these are the ways of our God. And this is the day that we call Good Friday. We stand to sing our final hymn this evening from Mission Praise number 750. What kind of love is this?
Lord, we have no words adequate enough to follow what you have done for us. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, with God's blessing resting upon us, may we leave this place this night as we do so in silence.